Chapter 6 The Municipality Libertarian municipalism is the name of the process that seeks to recreate and expand the democratic political realm as a realm of community self-management. As such, the starting place for this process must be the community. A community comprises individuals whose dwellings are clustered in the vicinity of a distinct public space, forming a discernible community entity. This public space, whether it be a square, a park or even a street, is the place where private life shades into public life, where the personal becomes more or less the communal. Behind their private doorways, people enjoy the pleasures and cope with the demands of private life, but once one leaves one's doorway, one enters into a world where he or she is accessible to others, even as a degree of the closeness of private life is preserved. Here people encounter one another, unmediated by telephones or written messages, on a regular or occasional basis, and after repeated encounters, they may become acquainted. It is not shared kinship or ethnicity that makes possible the ties of a public sphere, although in some parts of cities, people of the same ethnic groups may choose to live in the same neighbourhood. Nor is it a common workplace from which people return after earning their daily bread. Rather, it is a residential proximity and the shared problems and interests that arise in a single community, such as environmental, educational and economic issues that form the underpinnings of a shared civic life. Encounters among community members are thus the germs of the political realm. The issues that community members have in common, as opposed to issues native to their private lives, become the subjects of concern in the political realm. To be sure, People encounter one another on a face-to-face -face basis in other areas of society, like the workplace and the university, and these areas too have their potential to be democratised. In fact, they must be. Only the community, however, is open to all adult members qua residents, not to workers and students alone, and can therefore become a broad arena for the management of community-wide affairs. It is from this incipient political level of the community that libertarian municipalism strives to create and renew the political realm, then expand it. Here, people can potentially reconstitute themselves from isolated monads into citizens who recognise each other, are mutually interdependent, and as such are concerned for their common welfare. It is here that they can create those political institutions that make for broad community participation and sustain them on an ongoing basis. It is here that citizenship can become meaningful as citizens regain and expand the power that state has usurped from them. Libertarian municipalism refers to such potential political communities as municipalities. To be sure, the municipalities that exist today vary widely in size and legal status. They may range from a small village or town in a rural area to a small city to a neighbourhood in a vast metropolis like New York but they still have sufficient features and traditions in common that we may use the same name for them. Their most important common feature is that they are all potentially sites of a nascent political realm, where the tradition of direct democracy that we have been discussing may be reviewed and expanded. To bring the nascent political realm of any municipality to its fulfilment as an arena of civic freedom, the governance of the city must be placed in the hands of its residents, the adult community members, or citizens. That is, it must be broken up and democratised. Decentralisation If the political potential of the municipality is to be fulfilled, community life must be rescaled to the dimensions suitable for a democratic political realm. That is, existing cities that are of any considerable size must be decentralised into smaller municipalities of a manageable size. Decentralisation takes several forms, but the one that is most important at the outset is institutional decentralisation. Institutional decentralisation is the decentralisation of cities' governmental structure. By creating political institutions in smaller municipalities where now only a larger one exists. In a large city, 
It could mean breaking up the city government and shifting the locus of power and control from city hall to the various neighborhoods. In a smaller city or town, it could take a similar form, except that the local units would be fewer and larger in proportion to the presently existing city. In a rural village, the size of the existing unit is probably small enough that decentralization is not necessary. Ultimately, the decentralized city or town would see the creation of a multiplicity of neighborhood centers where there once was only one city hall, of new public spaces, and of a new infrastructure under the control of the smaller centers. It would see the development of local economic production. Green spaces could be created where residents could cultivate food in local gardens. People who now spend hours commuting to senseless paper shuffling jobs might prefer to spend their time developing their talents for carpentry or pottery or weaving or architectural design and it turning into a full-time activity. They may find it more meaningful to join a healing or caring profession or to educate the community's young people in history or literature or mathematics than to sell, say, life insurance or real estate. Others might prefer to spend most of their time looking after very young children in whatever child-rearing arrangements the community decides upon. Decentralization would hardly require that all the institutions common to city life be replicated in miniature in each neighborhood. Universities, for example, could be preserved as centers for learning. Certainly, it would be impractical to establish a new university in each neighborhood nor need major hospitals be eliminated in favour of smaller clinics. Nor would cultural institutions, like theatres and museums, necessarily be broken up and replaced with small theatres and museums in each neighbourhood, but they would be removed from private ownership and returned to the control of the community where they are located. Moreover, the revival of community political life and the return to a smaller scale could well bring about a cultural awakening in the neighbourhoods, in that citizens might want and need to establish schools and healing centres and theatres and museums in their municipality, despite their access to the existing larger ones. Even as institutional decentralization is occurring, physical decentralization could also begin. Physical decentralization is the breakup of a large city's built environment in terms of its terrain and infrastructure. The smaller municipalities would need proportionately smaller city centres than the city hall, as well as smaller infrastructure systems, public spaces and the like. New green spaces could be created near the centre of each new municipality so that the new civic life has a focus. Not coincidentally, decentralisation would also help rebalance the equilibrium between city and countryside, between social life and the biosphere. Indeed, Physical decentralization would be indispensable to constructing an ecologically sound community. Democratization As decentralization of both kinds is taking place, the new and smaller municipalities would also be undergoing a process of democratization. This process of democratization, in fact, will be inseparable from decentralization. Here, the new, smaller municipalities would become the sites of direct democracies. The institutional structure of these direct democracies would be citizens' assemblies, large general meetings in which all the citizens of a given area meet, deliberate and make decisions on matters of common concern. These assemblies would partake of the most enlightened precepts and practices established by their predecessors in the tradition of direct democracy, the Ecclesia in ancient Athens, the Conjuratio and the assemblies in the medieval communes, the town meetings in New England and the sectional assemblies in Paris, as well as other instances of direct democracy from any part of the world, regardless of whether they were indigenous to a particular region's history and traditions. Of course, the citizens who create these assemblies would not use the Ecclesia, the town meeting and so on as models or blueprints. That would mean incorporating, rather than throwing into the dustbin of history, hierarchies of ethnicity, race, gender and the like, as well as accompanying prejudices. Rather, the citizens would look at their predecessors primarily for their specific democratic political institutions, 
and they would advance them further by opening them to the participation of all adults. The assemblies would meet at regular intervals, perhaps every month at first, and later weekly, with additional meetings as citizens saw fit. They could meet in an auditorium, theatre, courtyard, hall, park, or even a church. Indeed, in any local facility that was sufficiently large to hold all the concerned citizens of the municipality. The workings of the assembly would follow the canons of political decorum that are fair to all and allow the widest possible participation, yet at the same time keep the length of meetings within an agreed and reasonable time frame. One of the first actions of an assembly would be to constitute itself, that is, to define itself and to draw up a set of bylaws by which it would conduct its proceedings. These bylaws would establish decision-making procedures and offices, as well as the means of selecting the individuals who will hold these offices and the means of holding them accountable to the assembly as a whole. The bylaws could also establish consultative and administrative neighbourhood committees, councils and boards to study and make recommendations on various issues and to enforce the assembly's policies. They and their work would be under the continual review of the assembly and their members would be subject to immediate recall. That is to say, if the members violated any of the community rules concerning the powers of councils and boards, the citizens would have the right to deprive them of their office and choose replacements for them. In advance of each meeting, an agenda would be drawn up made of items and issues that citizens have asked the Assembly to consider. The agenda would be announced well before the meeting, at least several days in advance, in order to give citizens the time to marshal whatever contribution they would like to make to the discussion of a specific issue. At a given meeting, each issue on the agenda would be debated in the presence of the assembled citizens. All sides of an issue, arguments and counter-arguments, would be aired as thoroughly as possible. Indeed, a direct democratic society that fulfilled the promise of freedom would not only permit debate, it would foster it. Its political institutions would be ongoing discussion forums, and its assemblies and media would be open to the fullest expression of all points of view. To assure that different points of view are heard, everyone would have the full right to speech before the assembly. At first, most likely, those who do not yet feel themselves sufficiently articulate would be satisfied that someone else who shares their view has expressed it satisfactorily. But after observing and absorbing the deliberative process as it unfolds over time, it would be hoped, indeed expected, that they too would gain sufficient confidence to speak for themselves. As citizens gained experience in presenting their opinions in public, they would become more articulate, more able to convey arguments that they considered to be of vital importance, yet also cognizant, if they were not already, of the need for restraint and decorum. After a given debate, citizens would vote according to their best understanding of their vote's consequences for themselves, for other individual members of the community, and for the common good. The votes would be taken by majority rule, that is, if as little as 51% of the citizens favour the measure, it would be passed. Decision-making processes Many alternative people, especially those of a libertarian orientation, reject majority rule as a principle for decision-making because after a vote is taken, the view of the majority becomes the established policy for the whole community and thereby gains the force of law to some degree. Inasmuch as the community as a whole must conform to the decision, they argue, quite aside from individual predilections, Majority rule is coercive and therefore inconsistent with individual freedom. In this view, as stated by historian Peter Marshall, quote, the majority has no more right to dictate to the minority, even a minority of one, than the minority to the majority. Unquote. The form of decision making most commonly composed as an alternative is the process of consensus, which, unlike majority rule, supposedly preserves personal autonomy. In a consensus process, no decision is final until every member of the community agrees with it. Even one dissenter can obstruct its passage. Such obstruction is all to the good 
these libertarians believe, if the dissenter's own will differs from the view of the majority, such a person has the unconditional right to veto a decision. Consensus decision-making has its strong points, and it may well be appropriate for small groups of people who are very familiar with one another. But when larger, heterogeneous groups try to make decisions by consensus, serious problems often arise. By prioritizing the will of the individual, the process allows small minorities, even a minority of one, to thwart decisions that the majority of the community supports. And individuals will dissent, for not every community member will agree with every given decision, nor should they do so. Conflict is endemic to politics, a sine qua non, indeed a circumstance of its existence, and dissenters are, fortunately, ever-present. Some individuals will always feel that a particular decision is not beneficial, either to their own interests or the public good. But communities that govern themselves by a consensus process often reach consensus by manipulating dissidents into going along with the majority position, or even coercing them sub rosa, using psychological pressure or making discreet threats. This type of coercion may not happen in public view. It could, and often does, happen outside the scrutiny of assembly but it would be no less coercive for that, and it would be more pernicious. When the issue in question comes up for a vote, the coerced or manipulated dissenters tend to let themselves go on public record in favour of the measure, perhaps to avoid offending the majority. Despite their strong opposition to it, in that case, their very real dissent is no longer a matter of public record, a respected, if failed, effort. Indeed, their dissent would be erased as if it had never existed, much to the detriment of the group's political development. Alternatively, if dissenters cannot be pressured to change their vote, they may be successfully pressured into declining to vote at all. That is, they may choose, in inverted commas, to withdraw from the decision-making process on that issue, to stand aside, in inverted commas, in the jargon of the consensus procedure. But this choice, in effect, nullifies the dissenter as a political being. It resolves the problem of dissent essentially by removing the dissenter from the public sphere and eliminating the dissenting view from the forum of ideas. By insisting on unanimous agreement, consensus either intensifies conflict to the point of fracturing the community, or else it silences dissent altogether. Rather than respect minorities, it mutes them. A far more honourable and morally healthy way of handling dissent is to allow dissidents to vote openly, with high visibility, in accordance with their beliefs, with the prospect of altering the decision in the future and potentially fostering the political development of the community. In a community where decisions are made by majority rule, the minority does indeed have to conform to the decision of the majority, lest social life disintegrate into a cacophony of fractious individuals. But the minority retains the crucial freedom to try to overturn the decision. It is free to openly and persistently articulate its recent disagreements in an orderly manner to the other community members, in order to try to persuade them to reconsider the position. By dissenting, even passionately, the minority keeps an issue alive and lays the groundwork for altering a bad decision and becoming the majority in its own right hopefully advancing the political consciousness of the community. Dissenters will and should always exist in a free society, if it is not to sink into stagnation. At issue here is whether they will have the freedom to express their dissent. Democratic decision-making, by majority rule, assures dissenters of that freedom, inscribing their dissent in the community records as public testimony to their position.